Okay. And since my, I don't know what you guys have in time, but my time does say it's 631. So um, I want to uh, welcome everybody to the Rutgers uh, Cooperative Extensions in the Know to Grow. And we wanted to um, welcome Jean Kramner, who is a master gardener in Ocean County, um, that's going to present our talk this evening. And we just want to make you aware that our last actual um, talk is going to be, um, sorry, <laughs> is going to be uh, Irene Wanitz in uh, Plants for Winter Interest. Um, and that will be on uh, uh, Tuesday, the 20th, October 20th. And we are looking for um, topics that we may uh, start presenting again in January. So Patty and I are working on that to uh, keep you guys involved and in, in involved <laughs> and informed. <laughs> so I wanted to, uh, Jean, I'm going to take it away, let you take it away because I do have a few people I need to uh, answer about their sound. So, all right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, mm -hmm. Susan. Thanks, Patty, for your help with the presentation also. You're welcome, welcome, everybody. I'm so happy that you're all joining us tonight for this presentation, whether you're new to terrariums or it's something that um, you want to, you have been doing. I hope I can provide some tips and helpful information to you. Um, I want to make a couple notes before we start. One is that because we're giving this in conjunction with Rutgers, we're Rutgers Master Gardeners, and that is a state institution, I'm not going to be able to give you any product recommendations or sources like vendors where you can get anything, but you can always go on the web. There's plenty of information available and I'll try to be as complete as I can as we go through. So, you know um, what to look for. In addition, I know that yesterday you were all mailed out um, a little fact sheet that described the history of terrariums and also has a very comprehensive um, plant list. So, what I'm going to do as I go through these slides too, um, in addition to what's on the content of the slides, I'm going to point out the plants that I'm able to identify for you so that you can match them up. And maybe if you want to take a note, that that's something you want to look for as you go to the store and start building your own terrariums. Okay, so, um, okay, so I'm doing this on behalf of the Master Gardeners of Ocean County. Um, and this is Cooperative Extension of Ocean County, which is the Rutgers New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station Extension Center for where you can call us for your um, gardening questions, tip questions, um, whether it's produce or house plants, garden flowers, we're your source of information that's scientifically based and we've all been educated through the Rutgers program, so you can um, depend on it as good, reliable information. This original presentation was made by a former master gardener named Henny Terre, and um, Patty and I have added to it for tonight's presentation. And also, um, we added to it mostly to add some content and make it more usable are user friendly for you because I'm used to doing this as a demo in person, but of course, COVID-19 is changing all that for now. So while we're on this first screen, I want to put, I'll point out a couple of plants to you. Um, they're kind of small, so I can't recognize them all, but in here is Pilea, which is readily available. And here, these are air plants. I'm sure you're all familiar with them, Tilsandias. Notice they come in all different colors. While we're on Tilsandias too, I want to mention um, that they do not require soil. So you can really put them in any kind of terrarium format. You could set them on a log, set them on gravel, sand, soil, it doesn't matter. As long as you take them out once a week or so and soak them in water, they really, they live, they're epiphytes, so they live off what's, they attach to some other structure in nature and they get their nutrients from the air and the moisture. And then over here, these two tall closed terrariums have orchids. This one right here is a Papiopetalum lady slipper orchid you may be familiar with. They're like um, not the easiest to grow, but they're among the easiest. They're not the very easiest though. 
And this one is a jewel orchid. Do you see it this color? Oops, sorry. Um, okay, so the history, the origin of terrariums, the use of transplant transparent containers for growing plants dates back 2,500 years to Greece. And in the US, it's believed to have originated in New England, where women placed squawberry, partridge berry plants in hand blown glass vessels. The invention of the terrarium is credited to 19th century London physician, Dr. Ward. Um, this says here that he saw a seedling of a fern growing inside a closed bottle containing moist earth, leading to study of other plants and containers. And he published a book on growing plants in closely glazed cases. But I would like to point out, you may read in the handout, um, this, this actually sounds very scientific, but it came from an accident. He was actually trying to um, have a chrysalis of a butterfly in a case. But when that failed, he looked and noticed that other things were sprouting in the soil that he had enclosed in the box. So that's how it started. He wasn't actually starting out to grow um, plant life in the cases. So that led to the development of what we now call Wardian cases. And he was using them once they were proven effective. They were shipping plant life from South Africa to Australia. And as that caught on and people realized how well certain tender plants did, they became like a Victorian item where people could grow different um, moisture loving and high temperature type plants in their house. Notice here what is kind of cool. It's like a little miniature greenhouse. You see the little vent here? You can actually pop the lid and let some moisture out or temperature depending what, what is required. These things are quite expensive. If you ever see them um, online or at a yard sale or something, they're really um, very collectible now. Okay, types of containers. Open containers are displayed here. You can use aquariums, goldfish bowls, terrines, canning jars, brandy snifters like this one here. Um, these are actually all terrariums that I have made. And I like to go to thrift stores and yard sales. There's like endless possibilities of the containers that are out there that you can use for your terrariums. This one has um, a miniature African violet. And let me look at my notes. I forgot quickly what this other plant is here. Oh, that is club moss. Club moss is really cool. It grows a lot of aerial roots. So you can easily pinch off and start new terrariums with it. Here is um, a terrarium that's open also, and it has some succulents. This is, um, let me get my cursor back here, Crashula, which is in the jade family. Here's the Echeveria. These are cool. They come in um, a lot of different colors, a lot of pretty pastels when they're growing, yellows, greens, oranges, purples, pinks. And here's an African violet in full bloom in one of my terrariums. So that when they're open, they're going to require more frequent watering because but because they're drier, they're less subject to disease problems. And the bigger the opening, of course, the easier it is to plant in them. Closed containers, um, we just talked about, and I showed you a picture of a Wardian case. Cold frames, bell jars, apothecary jars, cloches. This is an example of a cloche. This lid lifts off. Here is a miniature light bulb with a couple things growing inside of it. These are too small, so I'm unfortunately unable to identify the plants that are in them. And here's just a cold, closed apothecary jar. Okay, plant picks for fun foliage. Mix and match foliage plants. Add colors and textual interest to your design. 
Um, here is Fetonia. This is um, oak leaf fig, uh, oak leaf ficus. I'm sorry. Um, this is polka dot plant, friendship plant, which is also pilea, silver nerve plant, which let me look that up real quick for you. That is also another kind of Fetonia, and this is watermelon peperomia. There's a whole variety of peperomias too. This one is quite striking. So even though there's some greens, mostly greens, they have fun foliage, as this headline says here, or caption, um, with different patterns and textures. This one is like very textured, um, bumpy feeling. Okay, I had a flowering plant for a pop of color. Here again, uh, this is one of my terrariums with African violet. Obviously, I snuck it down in there when it was much smaller, but it grew into a nice plant. And here is flame violet, which is actually not a African violet or any type of violet at all. It's an episcia, it's an evergreen with a pretty flowers, as you can see. Over here in this corner is a moth orchid, Phalaenopsis. That's one of the easiest kind to grow. You usually see them in the grocery stores or the home improvement stores. And here again is a pretty African violet. Ivies, ferns, mosses, okay. Um, spike moss. Ivies, I would say if you can get some miniature ivies, there's a lot of things out there. Maiden hair fern, button fern, but there's plenty of different fern varieties and they all do like really well. They love the moisture and the enclosed environment of a terrarium. They all have similar light and moisture requirements. Succulents, as we were talking about before in the one I showed you, they prefer bright light and soil that dries between watering. Because of that, um, you see that this is an open container. I wouldn't plant them in a sealed up container. They need a decent size opening. Or they're gonna get too wet and not be happy at all. This is a jade crassula. Burrow's tail, this is a little one, but they usually um, grow very long, trail down. They're kind of um, delicate. If you touch them, it's easy to knock the leaves off, but that's also in the Crassula family. Here's an Echeveria, which I mentioned earlier, and you can see the pretty pastel colors that it has. This zebra cactus is actually Hawthornia. And um, I, they're nice, tidy little plants. I, I have a big preference toward them for terrariums. And they shoot out little pups around, around the base here, which you can easily pinch off, share with your friends or start new terrariums. The jade plant family is very large and um, if you're not sure when you look over plants, one way I always, used to identify jade or crassula is see how plump the leaves are. Almost every plant that I know of in that genus has these nice plump leaves. Likewise, the echeveria is spread out in a pattern like this, low growing. Okay, these again are some of my terrariums with carnivorous plants. They thrive in a terrarium's humid environment. These are also soilless. You need to just plant some um, sphagnum moss in the bottom, keep it really wet, maybe a little charcoal to keep the air and the moisture pure and clear. And also with the carnivorous plants, it's a must that they receive rainwater or distilled water. Any kind of minerals or fertilizers a no-no for carnivores. They're going to get all the nutrients they need from the bugs that they collect. And I hate to tell you all, but they're probably going to get enough bugs in your house, even though you may not see them. <laughs> they're there 
and they're able to pick them out of the air. And if you want, you can, if you like, like my house, I live by the water. So I have green headed flies. I have mosquitoes. Um, I've been known to swat one and dump it in a pitcher plant once in a while. They seem to like it. So here's a Venus fly trap. You can see the little teeth that close up. Pitcher plants. Um, here's a sundew. These little fronds close up like your hand around the bug. Here is some moss from my yard that I put in one. And here is some reindeer lichens. Okay, air plants, where I mentioned those before also, they come in some very unusual shapes, and some of them are actually quite large. Um, again, though, these, these are probably the ultimate in easy care. They don't need soil. They don't need to be watered except for taken out of their container once a week or so, soak them in some water for half an hour. Um, opposite of carnivores, though, the still water is deadly to them, so please give them just regular tap water. Tools, you need, uh, well, if you, if you have a skinny opening, you're gonna need a funnel to get the growing media down in. Um, you need long handled sticks or tweezers, spoons or sticks with cords on the end to tamp the soil down cotton swabs to clean any soil from the sides of the container, and a spray bottle to water, scissors to prune. You see there's some long handle tools here for different things, um, but don't feel like you have to buy special tools. Before I collected some of these items, since I do this all the time, I'm, you know, you can grab a stick and a piece of scotch tape and tape a Q-tip to it and stick it down in the cleaner sides or a coat hanger works well. You can grab whatever you think will do the job. Okay, and then materials for inside the container for your planting medium, you're gonna need pebbles for drainage in the bottom, much like you would plant if you're familiar with planting any of your house plants or outdoor plants in a pot that doesn't have drainage holes. You want a good layer of gravel so that any excess moisture can go down there and not harm the roots while it's drying out. You want to wash that. And also you need activated charcoal, which is common in pet stores, for example. You can, they, I have seen um, actually in some of the specialty stores, horticultural charcoal, but to tell you the truth, I don't think it's any different than a charcoal you would buy for a filter in your aquarium. Again, that would be rinsed well and put on top of the pebbles. Then you need a layer of moss. Um, this moss is quite green. Actually, I use sphagnum moss, or you can use a thin layer of some landscape fabric or some, anything that's gonna keep a barrier between the charcoal and the rocks and the soil that you're gonna put on top of it because you don't want it all washing through then you will also need the growing media. And this is like generic to say growing media because you want to tailor that to what you're planting. Cactus need very different soils that are light and with good drainage as opposed to a heavier soil that you would use for another house plant or some of your ha uh, flowering plants like African violets. And then of course the plants. And then decorating, this is totally a personal choice. You, you don't have to add decorations if you feel you just want it to be plants. But um, after planting, you can mist the plants, wash away any growing leaves, to wash away growing patty. I'm sorry, you're right over the, um, I have boxes over my text here any dirt that got on the side of the leaves or containers. You can also, instead of misting, you can also use like a small paintbrush. Okay, then you can, on top of the soil, you can add gravel, moss, other natural materials, or accessories to give a finished appearance once the plants are positioned and cleaned. So they can be like, you know, here, 
I use some of these when I use some of the succulents that remind me of underwater plants. Um, you can use marbles. Here's some pretty rocks that I've collected and some different mosses and just some little doodads. It's a personal thing. Um, there's no hard and fast rules. Whatever makes you happy is how your terrarium should be. Oops, sorry. Okay, so as I said before, you're going to layer the plant materials, the wash, aquarium gravel, the aquarium carbon, fiberglass screening, landscape fabric, or sphagnum moss, and the growing medium. There's a comment down here. If you're concerned about where you're getting your plants from and you think there's a chance they may be diseased, you could put them in a quarantine by covering them with a plastic bag and pl place it in a bright light for about two weeks and just watching to see if anything develops that you wouldn't want to put in your terrarium with the other plants you'll be adding to it. Okay, the planting medium should be just moist enough so that when you squeeze it with your hand, it will like, I don't want to say clump up like a ball, but uh, you can feel the moisture in it, but it will still break apart a little bit. Take plants from the pots, remove the growing medium to expose the roots. Um, if your soil is limited, if you have enough room to dig a little hole and it's a little tiny plant, there are some terrarium plants that come in really small um, pots, so you could really just plant the root ball and not disturb the roots. Trim off any yellowed or damaged leaves. Trim off some roots from the plants that were extremely pot bound. Um, I like to think of this as like kind of like a bonsai technique too, because you want to make sure that the roots can fit in the pot you're putting it in. And you also are trying to keep the growth to a minimum. We'll talk about that later when we talk about fertilizing. And then fill in the hole with the growing medium and tamp to firm it. Think about the overall design. So how do you want this to be viewed? View the terrarium from one side. You can slope it so soil is deeper to make a landscape more interesting and place the tallest plants toward the back or off center to create an asymmetrical design. Once your terrarium is planted, add accessories and the soil covers if desired, which is any kind of uh, pebbles or moss or whatever, you know, whatever you think if you would like to not see the bare soil, you can add a little mulch. Um, here's a Fake frog, I don't know why we're, <laughs> just in case, if you wanted to put a real frog, that's called a vivarium, and that's discussed in the handout that we gave you. Um, I don't really know much about them, so we're not going to talk about that. But you can certainly put fake frogs in with no problem. Okay, the care of your terrarium. Do not fertilize to keep the plants diminutive and slow growing. Um, I, I will make one exception to that. If you have flowering plants and you see that they're not flowering and you know that their right, light requirements and other needs are being met and they have reached a point where they're not flowering, you can probably use a liquid fertilizer for flowering plants. They have specialty ones for African violets. Um, and just use it at a diluted strength, maybe quarter what the uh, package directions say. Continually watch for, for and remove fallen leaves or decaying plant parts. They're gonna create an environment where diseases can occur. So you wanna get them out of there. What are open terrariums from once a week to once a month, depending on the demands of the plants that you have? Check for moisture. If a quarter of the soil depth is lighter colored than the rest, spray it with a small amount of water and recheck the color. If you have too much water in a closed terrarium, you can kind of measure that by watching the condensation. You're going to get some condensation. That's good because you're almost creating like a rainforest effect. The, the water is going to rise up during the day and fall back down on the plants at night. But if it's too heavy, um, it could mean that there's too much moisture 
and you need to let some air in and you're going to have to open the top for once in a while and let some of that out so you find that you have the right balance. Wilting plants or failure of condensation to form indicates the need for water. Add just a little bit of water. Sometimes I just, if I have real small containers, I just add a couple teaspoons and you would believe it or not, it's enough. Um, it's something, you know, touch and feel. You have to see how your plants are responding. When watering the closed terrarium, replace the cover only after the wet foliage has dried. A small amount of condensation indicates that no more water is needed. Closed terrariums should not be placed in sunlight because, um, okay, you can put it back from a window, but don't forget that that glass and that moisture in there is going to intensify the rays of the sun that are hitting it. So you can make it too hot and actually cook your plants. It's not a good, not a good deal. And also, again, with the light, we're trying, like with the fertilizer, we're trying to keep the growth rate down a bit. Okay, most plants suitable for terrariums do well in bright and direct light. If the terrarium is in a low light location, supplement with artificial light, for example, a 100 watt fluorescent bulb or fluorescent tube. So when this, um, when this slideshow was first created, I don't know if we had the cool, cool, actually cool to the touch, actually, and temperature LED lights. They're also a very good option. And some come with the ability to um, adjust the spectrum of light, depending on the plant needs, whether you're having blue rays, red or white or a combination of all the above. Operate the supplemental artificial light for 16 to 18 hours a day. Plants gradually face the direction of the light. Turn occasionally to keep them growing to, um, for desired angles. Unless you're lucky enough to have constant overhead light, then you have a nice straight up growing plant. Um, this again is one of the terrariums I made and you see I have a fern. Um, there's, this is carnivores actually. Um, so there's a fern in here with some thread leaf sundew, which is native to the pine barrens. I'm lucky enough to have a little bit growing. Um, some fig leaf ficus and just some sphagnum moss, I guess, and the rest of it. Temperature. Many terrarium plants are tropical and well suited for normal house temperatures, which is why we're growing them in the house as opposed to outside. Um, plants for low light respond well to night temperatures of 65 degrees Fahrenheit and day temperatures about 10 degrees higher. So kind of like humans like, so that's why they're compatible for us to grow in the house. Um, if the terrarium will be in direct sun, you will want to remove the lid as plants may become too hot. Uh, this, again, I'm going to point some things out. This is a Crassula jade family, another Crassula jade family. And this is a Sempervivum, which is a tropical one growing in a terrarium, but it's very similar to hens and chicks, which you grow in your yard all year around here. I'm sure you're familiar with them. They're cool too for propagating because they shoot little babies out beside the chicks, of course, as we call them. Humidity. Closed terrariums are usually quite moist and humid. Make sure to consider this when choosing plants. Carnivorous plants, mosses, some ferns, and nerve plants can tolerate high humidity. Heavy condensation could mean too much moisture. Open the lid temporarily, as we discussed a couple slides ago. This is quite wet, obviously. Can't even see inside. But, um, you know, it may, I can't see what the plants are, but it may be what they need, or it may be too much noise, moisture. Pruning. Many plants gradually outgrow the limits of their terrarium space, which is um, what we talked about before. We're trying not to encourage that, but of course, it's a living thing that's going to grow. Trimming brings the plant back into the constraints of the terrarium and often promotes side shoot growth that fills out the plant. Pinch out tips before the plants become too tall. 
and it will result in better growth and than severe cutbacks. Remove all trim vegetation from the terrarium. Again, because we don't want to create an environment that is conducive to disease and fungus growing in the bottom. Okay, a common terrarium staple, easy to find and grow, are mosses. Um, if you don't, I pull them out of the yard and I get a kick out of it, much like uh, war's experiment, I guess, because a lot of times other things will pop up. Um, if you find them unpleasant, you can just pluck them out, but some pretty cool things pop up sometimes. So here we have some terrariums with moss. I don't know the exact moss. I don't know what that dude's doing either, but he must have been a theme that someone created. These are one of my favorite containers if you can find them. The glass isn't like super duper clear, but uh, they make a nice tabletop addition. It's a biscuit jar. They look really cool. I have one in the office where I worked. Oh, I retired seven years and I made it a couple years before I retired. So it's going on like nine years. It's in the lobby of the office and it's so beautiful. It just closed up doing its thing. It's awesome. Okay, tiny worlds and terrariums. Let your creativity run wild. And I guess your kids too, if you want to have them help you create them. The possibilities are endless. Here's a someone with a sense of humor, I guess. Jurassic Park or something, something going on here. Um, here's one someone obviously made for a Valentine's gift or someone special. Put a little man with a sign that says, I love you. Purchase moss. Here are some reindeer moss, sheep moss, Spanish moss. Um, a lot of times you have a choice. You can either buy this in a dried fashion, add it for a decorative purpose, or you can find a supplier of live moss. I have purchased some a couple times off the internet and I've been very happy with the results. Or I'm not gonna go through this too much, but if you're interested in making your own moss, there's a recipe here. This will be available to you after if you want to um, check it out or there are recipes on the internet. Try a unique container. Carafts like this coffee pot make an interesting open terrarium. And uh, this is one I created an old incandescent bulb. There are special instructions for that on the internet as well. The opening, a lot of people think that I take this off here, but no, I actually get the plants down in through that little hole. And I have very minimum dirt in, or soil in there, I'm sorry, soil. And I have some moss and some phytonia. They do really well too. And quite the novelty item, of course, too. All right, these are gardens under glass. This is obviously someone who made some other use for their aquarium, a very large one at that. And I wouldn't be surprised looking at all the underneath here if it's not also some sort of vivarium. Looks like a cool place for some reptiles to hang out. And here's another one with a very unusual container with a small opening. All right, now I'm, I'm going to show you some of the ones I have made. Okay, these here are all um, carnivorous ones. Some of these are repeats of the ones we saw earlier. So these are carnivorous right here. Here's the African violet, another African violet. Um, here's some more carnivorous with a little close up view. Some ferns, sundews. Here's a Venus flytrap. Can you? This was a cool one. Which can you see the red inside? So it's um, I guess this color is part of its attraction to insects and lures them in there. Here's another one I made with um, in fact I still have these um, but these are photos of them. Here's sundews, and here again is some grasses that just came up. I thought they looked kind of cool, so I let them grow once in a while get a little interesting flower sprig or something off of them. And there's some ferns in there too.
All right, here's some more carnivorous, a pretty red pitcher plant, some reindeer lichens or moss. It's actually a lichen. A lot of people call it reindeer moss. Some more pretty pitcher plants. Notice the pretty patterns. Here's some grass again. I think a little mushroom came up in the terrarium, which is kind of cool to me. And here's another Venus flytrap. Another one here again, the thread leaf sundew. Here's a paddle leaf sundew. I'm not sure if this one is native, but they are native paddle sundews in the Pine Barrens as well. Um, there's a little sundew in here, right here. And I was really growing this terrarium with just some moss and sundews, but when I brought the soil inside, it must have been an impatient seed and surprise, it actually grew and flowered in my sunroom. So that was a cute little surprise that made a nice little different terrarium for a while. All right, here is another succulent terrarium. This is a, a cactus, like a barrel cactus. Here's another um, crassula or jade. I'm not sure what this one is, but it has nice fuzzy leaves. This is one I made to look like an aquarium or a little fishbowl. So it has some succulents. I put some gravel in the bottom to make it look like the bottom of an aquarium. And these are um, little rubber clownfish that I found in a craft store. And they're on real, oops, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They're on real skinny little wires so you can barely see them, just enough to hold the fish up, make it cute for a kid's room or wherever. Um, here's another one I made to look like the bottom of the sea. That was the plan with the mermaid and some succulents, seashells. Here's some seahorses with some other succulents. This is actually, um, okay, so here is another crassula, like a jade plant. This one, I'm sorry, I don't know the name. This one is crassula mucosa. It's a zipper plant, but it looks kind of like a, it looked like a coral or a fan under the sea to me. So I used that in there. That grows crazy too, the roots very easily if you were interested. Here is a bunch I had for a holiday sale. See, these are here. This is just a little jar with a little birdhouse hanging in it and just moss. You can make them as simple or elaborate as you like. These are all closed terrariums up here. Here's the open one. Here's some more of the light bulb terrariums. Here are the air plants. So sandias that I use, I made them look like a beach thing. I used some sea glass and some white sand. Here are, here's a, a wide open dish that has succulents. It's a low terrarium. Here's some more light bulbs. Here's another light bulb, light bulbs, light bulbs. Um, and five years ago, my youngest son got married and I did all of the um, table decorations. So this is one I made for their table with their um, guest table seating cards at the front table. Um, let's see what's growing in here. There's a Chamadoria elegans, like Bella Palm, uh, Creeping Fig. Some Fetonia, some moss. There's actually, I have a little wire gazebo. It's hard to see. There's a gazebo in here. There's a light. They still have it in the living room. Here's some more that I use for centerpieces on the table. Um, in the bottom of these open terrariums, I use different sedums. They grow really fast and they're low growing. So I use them around the bottom and then put a um, barrel candle in and some bling ribbon. 
And people were happy. I made, let's see, there were 25 tables, so there were 50 of those. A lot of people took them home for little favors from the wedding. And these were some terrariums I made for the cocktail hour. Um, this is Fetonia again. And what I did to decorate these for a special occasion, I used the little flower tubes. You get little flower picks, you get in floral arrangements and put some carnations in to dress them up. And a week before his traditional wedding, um, he is originally from Ghana and his wife's parents are. So we had a traditional Ghanaian ceremony, which was kind of fun. And I made centerpieces for that as well. This is them getting set up. I used pathos and crotons, but these containers were quite large. They were about 18 inches tall. So you have to fit the plant you know, the scale scale is a thing too, you want to keep in mind. And here they are for the outdoor Ghanaian wedding. I've used, what I did was match the plants, crotons with a different color of the leaves so that I could use traditional kente cloth. You, I'm, you're probably familiar with this. It's originating in Ghana. And it has the pretty oranges, greens, blacks. So I thought the crotons would match it nice. And there's some more of them on the tables for the wedding. Again, they were nice take homes for people. And there's one close up. And that's the end of the slideshow I have tonight. Um, I do want to show you a couple things that I have in my house i'm going to spin the computer around a little bit and hopefully you can see them am i going the wrong way sorry oh no here we go this is i'll call it a poor man's wardian case it um it's actually just a leather box but it actually acts like a cloak so the whole thing lifts off and then I have a nice little terrarium in there. I don't know if you can see it very well, but I have some plants and, and try to make it like a little outdoor thing. Just put it on. Because I do so many terrariums, I keep a little I call these nurseries. They're just jars I have around the house. <laughs> and they're full of, this is an oak leaf ficus. The whole jar is just full of ficus and it has nice little aerial roots. So anytime I need some, I can just go in. Gene, I'm, I'm Gene. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm going to interrupt. If you can turn off your PowerPoint, because we can't, we, everybody sees you as a little tiny little screen. So if you turn yeah. off your PowerPoint, then we can show, or we'll see your original I'll try. screen. <laughs> Bear with me. That's okay. I think you can just put stop share. And you should be okay. Um, but we did have a couple of, a uh, couple of questions, nothing crazy. Um, but, and I think it'll be, you should pop in once you start talking again. All right. So share. I click stop, but it's not. All right. And then just close your PowerPoint. Just um, X out on your PowerPoint. Can I do that? There you go. And then you should. There you go. Now you're back to normal. Okay. It's a little blurry, but I, we can, I think people will get a better view than what they had before. Okay. So I just want to show you that I just pull pieces out. There's little roots down here. Are people seeing that? I'm not sure. I'm sorry. Can't see roots, but I can see green in your hand. Okay. The little ivy. Yeah. Okay. So I have things like that with the club moss, different ivies, that, you know, like a source to go to all the time because it gets kind of expensive going to the store all the time. Um, I'm going to put the my Wardian case back up too so you can see that maybe a little better now. These are so cool. <laughs> can you see that? Uh, yes, it's not clear what you have on the inside only because of the glare from the computer screen. Okay, so it's like a leaded glass case, but it's it's really it's not a warding case. I call it poor man's warding case because it's actually like a cloak, but that's that's what's inside. Okay, so you have a little 
little scene in there. I see a little chair. Yeah, like a little woodsy scene with things growing inside of there. Okay. There is a question while you're changing your your screens around um, or your uh, terrariums. Somebody wants to know: um, Did you change this? Do you change the soil once in a while? No, never. No, never, what? never, never. No. And then I I just to show you some of the little um, cool little succulents you can use. I don't know. Can you see that? Can't see the individuals, but yes, you can see the the textures and the colors. Yeah. So there's crassula. This is another crassula called tiger jade. This is um, sedum. Sedum ongo. It's like a golden sedum. And this is a little blue sedum. They spread real easy there. This is just a planter that I have with them, but I use them in all my terrariums as well. I can't wait till we can get back in person because we're definitely going to have you do a terrarium class. <laughs> we'll work on we'll work on that hopefully for 2021. Okay, so that's basically the end of my presentation. If there's any questions I could answer that have come in that you need me to answer, I'd be happy to. Okay, um, Patty, if you have any, I'm going to let you go first. I haven't actually seen any questions. That we haven't answered, okay. um, but people are really impressed with your talent. Because seriously, I mean, someone did say you're the terrarium wizard, and I agree. <laughs> well, it's just you know, it's just one of the things I enjoy, and I'm telling you, I've been <laughs> I've been doing them for a long time. It's just yeah. something I enjoy. So, and so, if you do, you know, when people do their own, like you, you, you know. Unless you're like experienced with all kind of house plants and really know, you know, what works well together and, and environments and soil conditions and things they need. I mean, gardening is like like the, a grand experiment sometimes. I mean, we can always go to scientific based information, but um, sometimes the best discoveries are made just by playing around, seeing what works for you. I you agree. shouldn't feel this. You shouldn't feel discouraged if, if your first one is not a success. It it yeah. I've had some that are awesome, and I've made them at the same time with my kids, and I have others that are just dogs. <laughs> it just depended on <laughs> who accidentally put too much water in, and I have yeah, done it yeah, where I right, had to right, dump right. out the water. <laughs> so right, um, right, a little bit too much of water is going to throw everything off, and you you know you got to monitor it. But when you get everything right and put the lid on it, like I say, I. These jars that I showed you that I use for like a nursery, I don't I don't do anything to them. If I notice one, you know, maybe a couple times a year I put a little moisture in there. If I notice that they're um getting, you know, I don't see the condensation that I like to see on the side during the day, then I'll say, oh, maybe it needs a little bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and give it some, but very, very little. Okay, you are getting a bunch of questions that are popping up. Um, I do have Deb asked, um, do you make your own soil mediums? And what would you use for succulents? And oh, one, that goes, yeah, one that goes ahead. with it was about the size, how much soil you're putting in because somebody said you have a lot of stone too. So it was kind of a question together. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm glad you asked that because I wanted to go over that. The handout has in, in like a, a recipes for different mixtures for different kinds of plants. But, um, you know, unless you're really into that and want to do that, um, there's so many commercially available bags of soil now. You can buy soil for succulents, orchids, African violets. African violet soil, I use it for anything that flowers. So anthuriums, I have a lot of anthuriums that do well with it. So, so it's really not necessary to make your own. But of course, like we discussed in some of the slides, they all, you know, like cactus needs a very loose, well-drained soil. It can't be a lot of heat and organic matter in it that's holding moisture because the roots are going to die. So you just need to tailor the soil to the plants that you're planting in the terrarium. Um, and then the depth, um, you know, I try to... <laughs> You don't want to, if you have like a tiny terrarium, you don't want to put too much soil in so the plants are coming up to the top. So it's okay to use like, you know, an inch or two if you want to. But it, it, because again, we're talking about keeping the plants diminutive. We don't want to provide 
an overabundance of soil that contains the same nutrients that would you would be adding from a fertilizer. So, you know, you put too much soil, there's more room for the roots to grow. We're trying to keep everything just like stable. So, excess soils not necessary. Okay. Um, there was also, I don't know, Patty, did you have one? I, I have one if you don't. Um, I, there was, where do you find miniature plants? I don't know oh, that we can really, we can't really well, give sources. But you can give no, no, I'm not, I'm not, I can't, I can't give sources, but they are there. They're on the internet some places. Um, it, it's, you know, I remember years ago, there used to be some cool nurseries where, and you could find like a lot of cool house plants in, in grocery stores and, you know, little um, stores. But now, now you really have to go to like a specialty store. And I, I go to Philly. There's a couple that I go to in Philly, but, you know, everybody has their source. But again, I don't want to run to Philly all the time. So that's why I keep my little nursery plants going in jars. So that I have sources, you know, I have succulents I can take cuttings off of and. You know. Yeah, I know that there's um, some uh, at least 2 big places I can think of in Monmouth County. Um, not saying names, but of garden centers. There's also, I think. Um, in uh, Atlantic County towards the south, look for the larger garden centers call and ask them if they carry miniature house plants. A lot of people are starting to get back into it um, for the local mom and pops. Um, but with COVID-19, of course, things have definitely changed a wee bit. Um, and succulents, uh, I, succulents seem popular a lot of places. Yes. OK, yes, uh, the succulents would be an easier find. Definitely it, air plants yeah. are hit or miss, but definitely a bigger garden center will have it. Somebody that might have a florist. Uh, with it as well. Um, there's also they Ocean also County, there's market. They also market these um, small little plants um, for fairy gardens. So, you know, kind of think of the mom and pop shops that might be, you know, search for places that do those kind of events. And you know, they're out there. You just maybe have to kind of even yeah, maybe even a florist, your local florist, could get some for you too. So you can find them, but they, they it's going to take a little bit, especially if you're looking for some of the unusuals. Also, the Philadelphia Flower Show, when that's back up and running, they always have a ton. Uh, you can get moss. You can get some really unusual things there. Um, yeah. That's a whole bunch of different vendors, so I feel safe enough saying that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we're just not supposed to promote one person over another, which is why we don't give out names. Um, but, Jean, there was a question from uh, Luan about, um, is it better to use rainwater to avoid salt buildup? Um. I do myself, especially if it's a closed terrarium. They seem to do better with distilled or rainwater. Distilled water is the same. That's the phone. Right. Now you can't, you said don't use distilled water with something though before. Air plants. Air plants. It's a death okay. sentence. I don't know <laughs> yes. why, but they, no. Okay. And I also know a lot of people don't think about it. If you have a water softener, do not use that water for your plants. That's too Correct. much salt. So. Correct. Yes, definitely. That's for any plants. <laughs> That's yeah. And and again, um, uh, with a fertilizer, if you use a liquid fertilizer, you like I'm not going to say a brand again. Sorry, I almost did. <laughs> but, but you're going to get like a mineral buildup in the soil and around the edge with that too. So you, that's another reason to avoid that. Go ahead, Patty. I think. Um, there's a couple more questions. Uh, do the lids for the closed containers need to be taken off? Not if everything it's inside is hunky dory, no. Yeah, it's kind of this it's kind of this balance you just have to learn. Yeah. You know, if there's it's trial and error, I think. Yeah. And until you get kind of used to doing it. Like Yep. It 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 comes more naturally to me now, you know, the, the balance. But either way, even with myself, I have to watch it for a few days and make sure I got everything going right in there. You can also- Yeah, I just find that if, I, if there's so much condensation built up that I can't see the plants, I usually will like just top, you know, take the top and just cock it off to the side just to let some of that evaporate out and then I close her back up. But I've even done that like, and and I mean, if you if it's too much, and you want to do it quickly, you can even wipe the side with a paper towel inside yeah. and collect it. You know, 
I mean, because there's really not that much in there to begin with. And what can seem like an excess inside the jar isn't really that much at all. It's just that it's so concentrated inside the container. So mm -hmm. you, you need to adjust it. You know, I mean, like I say, wiping it with a paper towel or something works too. And I just got a, uh, someone asked, she has a water softener, so she wants to know where to buy the water. Um, you can get distilled water anywhere. Um, you, you know, anything that some people use it in their irons, you can buy it at the uh, pharmacy, store. grocery store. Yeah, you can grow it. You it's can about a dollar a gallon. It's about a dollar a gallon. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's usable. Um, yeah. Not spring people, water, distilled. Right, distilled. Yeah, some people have also said you can uh, boil your water to sterile, but that's to sterilize it, not to get the salt out. So that's not. Yeah, that doesn't take water. the minerals out. That's not the same as distilling. Okay. Um, I don't know if I see somebody else mentioned, uh, Geraldine mentioned they use clear plastic, um, uh, clear plastic containers. Uh, they use them in nursing homes um, in, in Monmouth County when they're doing terrariums. Um, I've used the plastic, you know, for kids. Somebody asked me privately about um, what do you do with kids? I go to my local, well, I work for Wawa when I'm not here, um, but I get, they have uh, the old, looks like the glass candy jars um, with the plastic lids that they yes. fill their candies with. And so I use the Tootsie Roll container and the kids loves it. It's big enough to get their hands in. So if anybody, I, I might be able to get you some uh, if anybody wants to try it, but um, you can ask at the local, at your local, um, any other mini marts or anybody that carries like touch rolls and things you can get those even a bubble gum container that has a screw on lid it just the screw on lid's a problem because it's not as easy to take off if you need to but yeah you can see like snack mixes with pretzels and things right. like that too. yes party yes. mix but, but um you know um the the one issue you want you want to keep in mind is the clarity as long as you could see through it probably it doesn't you know I mean, if you use glass and it's too thick, it's going to distort what you see inside too. So, mm -hmm. but it's classics fine too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a, that was a good point because my kids, yeah, it definitely turned out uh, too too crazy, uh, or not too crazy, but they, yeah, they kind of put everything in and they grew for a long time till mommy forgot to water because they watered too much so but uh yeah you do take the lid off and in order to dry it out it's easier to dry it out than it is to uh, somewhat uh leave it all on the drier side than it is to get rid of too much water yes. if it's floating so you do want to watch there because that's what the uh char uh activated charcoal is for as well to help keep the soil sweet yeah um i'm looking to see go ahead patty i, I saw know. um another one where would you place a succulent terrarium for sunlight Right, right, bright sun. Oh, bright sun. Okay. <laughs> yep, bright sun. Yeah. Sorry, I I thought you. Yeah, I didn't know. I was just expecting more to continue on. So, um, I I do. Sorry, I'm looking. Uh, in the. So I, we have a bunch of people that are asking for the handouts that haven't. Um, can you distance? Can we distance students get a handout? somehow sure just you guys yep. um, anybody that needs a handout just email me um you can e put your email in a private message so it's not out to everybody if unless you don't care um but i've been trying to send them out to those people so what happened was we did send out the handouts to the 85 people that were registered before yesterday um afternoon so anybody that registered after as is the six it, it was attached um to the webex but it, it's not the easiest thing to download i haven't figured out why they do it the way they do, but um, so we can get it to you, Sandra. Um, and then Lisa had a comment, I think, as well. Lisa, I don't know if it's a private. Does the lids close? The container need? Oh, that you said you entered that. I'm sorry, never mind. Yeah, I think we got that one. Sorry. Yep, I was behind the times on that one. So, um, but yeah, I just want to thank everybody for for coming on. You can, if you still have a question or two, pop it in the chat. Um, I want to also, once we are finished with, um, I close the program out. Um, there will be a pop up that comes up in your browser for a survey about our programs in general, and also um, what things you may guys might want to uh, hear since we are doing our lineup for next season. So we are looking at some, you know, cool things and try and. Uh, Get those questions answered that you guys have that are burning uh, in your in your mind. So, uh, Jean, I want to thank you again. Great talk. Um, I really think you know you definitely know your plants. Um, <laughs> I don't you. even know half the names no of those. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I want to say you know good job and the tram is beautiful and I loved I loved seeing it in the 
um, well, you said the ones that you had for sale were for charity, I believe it was for a charity yeah. event. So yes, yeah. cause that was a, yeah. Uh, and I think that that was a great thing to show, you know, what you can do on a small, small scale that people would be interested in, uh, as well. And it may be a great takeaway, something sustainable to a point. So, um, April saying, thank you. I'm saying Selma, thank you. Thank um, you. yeah, we need to have this presentation this again for Thanks. sure. We need to do this in person for sure and have oh, yeah. a hands-on demo. Yep. So I know I've, I've done it three or four times in person at libraries and things. Yeah. yeah and I was gonna say Salma's in uh, Mercer, but I'm sure we can we can either uh, reciprocate or you can come our way uh, once we open. Hopefully that'll be, uh, you know, won't be till before the new year. But um, you know, we won't know that schedule until uh, uh, we won't know that schedule for a little bit yet. Yeah, for a while. So. But all right. Uh, thank you again, Jean. Wonderful. And I love it. You're on time. Uh, <laughs> you actually made it. Um, I think you've been our first, in, myself included. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for coming. To, uh, our last talk is going to be next uh, two Tuesdays from now on the 20th. And it'll be with Irene Wannett on our um, uh, plants for with winter interest, I believe it is, or for winter interest um, to really show out your gardens, what you can add to your garden to help pop some color in there in the winter time. So uh, thank you again, and everybody have a thank great you. night. And please take the survey. Thank if you, you have so a much, Jean. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Great job. Good night. Thank Bye. you. Okay. Let me end. Sorry, guys. I'm talking to myself so I don't forget what I'm doing. <laughs>